podcast. As always, I got with me Dougie. How's it going today, Dougie? Doing good, doing good. Um, watching the, the Caps game here. Hopefully they can tie this up in the next five minutes or so and, and at least make it to OT where they'll promptly lose as they have been the rest of the season. Uh, <laughs> got some actual hockey weather out here in Raleigh. Uh, iced and snowed yesterday, so it's pretty on point to uh, to be back doing this. Yeah, how are you? Nice, right, so I'm doing well, I'm doing well. As, as always, I'm Danny P, guys, and this is the Flipping Pucks and Chucking Nuts podcast. Uh, just a couple of guys talking hockey. Uh, sport which we both uh, adore, but uh, yeah, let's just jump right into it. How how are the Capitals doing this season? Man, you, at the start of the season, I was hoping you know all the COVID shit would would be over and they can actually get a full eighty two in without any any eruptions and stuff like that. But as anyone who's been watching watching the game since you know they started, I mean, COVID protocol has been a thing, and they've they're constantly reworking that and how long people have to stay on there. And unlike, I mean, it's affected every team, um, mainly teams in Canada with the travel rules and stuff like that. But it's hit the Caps pretty hard. Um, I, they started the season without Backstrom, but he's he's been back here recently. But he's been on and off COVID protocol. I think he came back in November, and and he's only still played like four or five games since then because he's been back on. He he was he was hurt, but he came back, and then he was on COVID protocol and stuff like that. So the I mean. I still haven't seen a full Caps roster. Uh, I think they've been doing pretty good with treading ros- uh, treading water. Um, I know in kind of like our first episode, you know, I kind of touched on some rookies who might be playing and why they might not, not might not be playing. But uh, with all the, with all the COVID stuff, all of them have gotten in at this point and they've done pretty well. Um, I, I know typically with especially with the Caps pro- prospects, they're not like your high end offensive guys, like you know the Zegerses and the Milanos over in over in Anaheim and like Raymond and Detroit and stuff like that. But um, these guys have been slotted up and down the lineup. You know, they're, they're on the fourth line. They're on the first line the next game. It's, it's been a pretty crazy season, but um, I'm pretty pumped with how they've handled it. I think they're sitting third in the Metro uh, point behind Carolina, although Carolina has quite a few games, games in hand. So I mean, if Carolina takes care of their shit, they could definitely be like 10 points above Washington. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I can't really complain where they're at just based on how the season's gone. Um, for me, every game, I'm just looking for an Ovechkin goal. You know, I, I'm, I really want him to catch Gretzky. Obviously, I, I do want the Caps to make the playoffs, and I think they still will. Um, but it, games like this, right, where, where I mean, the Caps might lose, you know, Ovi had a power play goal, so I'm, I'm pretty pumped about that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I really can't complain. It sucks because I haven't fully, we haven't seen a full caps lineup re- mm-hmm. like recently. Um, yeah, it, I mean, but they, again, they've been treading water. Um, they're Vanacek and S- Samsonov and playing really well. I know at the, uh, at the outset in my kind of intro article on the, on the, um, kind of just basically predicting the Capitals roster going in the season, I had Vanacek winning the starting job, but Samsonov has definitely taken over that. Um, he's definitely got the bulk of the games and then rightfully so he's kind of, kind of proved me wrong. Not that I thought he'd play poorly, but I thought Vanacek would be, you know, a little bit more consistent, but Sammy's looked really good. Um, Vanacek's done okay when he had to, but even those guys have, have had to deal with the COVID stuff and the Cavs have had to pull up a couple of rookie goalies from the mind. Well, not really Well, rookies, but you know, seasoned AHL guys, you know, they're not like 19, 20 years old. They're mid twenties and stuff like that. Like Zach Vicali, um, who was drafted by Montreal years ago, almost to, to um, kind of take over for price when price kind of, kind of left. But, um, you know, he kind of bit his time in the minors and, and he's had some good looks for the caps. I think he's played like three games and he's two and one or something like that. His first game was a shutout versus Detroit. So that was pretty, that was pretty fun to see, and obviously his dad was in the building and stuff like that. So nice, um, nice. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I can't complain. Um, Caps can't win in overtime. I think I think they've made. Yeah, <laughs> I, which is, I think which, the uh, <laughs> I think the age of the Capitals. You know, once it once it once it gets to overtime, they're like, whoa, whoa, we didn't sign up for the extra hockey here. So it's it, it's it yeah it's it's almost comical at this point. I think they've made you know they've made it to overtime or or uh, a shootout like 12 times this season or something. And, and I'll, I'll, you know, I'll take the one point in the standings, but I, I swear they've only won two of those games and they were in the shootout. So um, anytime it goes into overtime, I, you know, I'm expecting a loss, but so if the caps can pull this out here in the next four and, and tie it up versus Vancouver, um, definitely expect a loss, but I'll take the point <laughs> battle back. But uh, so, yeah, I can't complain. So speaking of on Vancouver, is, isn't it good to see 
uh, Bruce Boudreau back behind the bench and taken Vancouver as far as, they, as, as as well as they got. I think he had, what, eight straight wins. I think he had the hardest start in NHL history with the, with the new team. And, uh, yeah, and I feel like that's always been his thing. When um years ago, I want to say it was 07, the 07 season, Backstrom's rookie year, um, the Capitals were in at the bottom of the standings. And um, they hired, they had fired um, their coach and hired Boudreaux. And that's he, that's what he did. He turned the team around and the Caps ended up making the playoffs that year. And at the time, I want to say that that was like the biggest gap that a team had has made from like start, at, starting in November. Like the, like at the time, that was the biggest like gap for a team to make the playoffs, to overcome and make the playoffs. Um, that's always been his thing. I think yeah. the the big question mark with Boudreaux is, is playoff success. Um, and yeah. I, I mean, I'm pumped that he's, he's doing well in Vancouver and it's kind of funny. He, uh, cause he, he's been doing like post game shit with the caps before he was hired. So like he, he's, he's been like an analyst <laughs> for Washington this season. Yeah. Like I, I, caps post game live, they've had him on and, and stuff like that. So it's, it's kind of funny to see, and I'm happy for him. I was always a huge fan, even though, you know, he really couldn't get the caps playoff success. I think he's a great players coach and, and he really knows an offensive system. And I think it'll work really well for Vancouver with like Besser and, and Pedersen and who two guys who have both been struggling in the season. So at the end of the day, do you think Vancouver ends up making the making the playoffs? Do you think they, they could they could they could battle in the, in the Pacific Division and make it? No. Um and I'm really putting that mainly because of COVID stuff. Um, I think that's really, I think that it's going to, the scheduling conflicts and stuff like that with postponed games might just hurt him long term. Um, but again, I don't think that's a Boudreaux thing. I think Boudreaux is going to get him as close as he can, but I just think, I honestly, I just feel bad for all these Canadian teams, right? Not just Vancouver. I feel like it's really affecting them in a negative way. Um, and then you have to think of the players too, how it affects their psyche. Yeah. It's, it's crazy though. Cause like when you think about all the Canadian teams now, right. I feel, it really feels like Vancouver and, and, and the Leafs are the only teams that are really making any noise. I guess the Flames as well. But, like, you know, the Canadians have, have plummeted. Ottawa is struggling again. Winnipeg, Paul Maurice, God bless his soul, just quit. He's like, okay, I'm the problem. I'm going to leave. Like, he's like, deuces, guys. Sorry. It's not It's not you guys. It's me. And when it, clearly it really wasn't, you know. So – it's, it's crazy how, with everything going on in the covert world, and especially up in Canada, how so many of these Canadian teams are struggling to get their, their, their feet underneath them and, and just crank out wins. And, and, and so, and yeah, that, well, the Maurice thing was kind of funny. It, it seemingly came out of nowhere, I thought. Yeah. Yeah. But like, like, yeah, exactly. So you have, I mean, obviously the, the Canadian teams can do their, you know, their U.S. tour, but they're going to have to quarantine and stuff when they go back to Canada. So you're looking at a week off or whatever for these players. So it's almost like they get multiple all-star or Olympic breaks during the course of the season. So I really feel like it's really hard to find your rhythm, then get back into it after you've had that layoff. And I think that's where it'll kind of slow them down. Um, but yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, again, another crazy year, man. I, 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 I hate it. I just want a full 82 to see what these teams are, are about. Yeah. Well, yeah. So you sort of saw that with the Hurricanes uh, just this week, really, where – one of their games got postponed, right? So they, they end up having like five days off. Slavin gets hit with with COVID, uh, a, a positive COVID test, and then they go and they play the Blue Jackets, a team that's just completely underneath them in the standings, and they just get completely blown out. You know, so it's hard for you know even even a team that's as strong as the Hurricanes right now, they're having issues with like going long stretches without actual game time. Did you have to think? Rod's are, like like you said with Rudger, Rod's a is a, a player's coach. So after a, a tough game, normally he gets the guys to have a day off, thinking that okay, yeah. tomorrow they're gonna go and they're gonna play again. Well, they don't end up playing that game. They can't practice. A third a third day comes around, they, they they get a practice in and then the next day they've got a game. Well now they've gone really seemingly three three of the four days without a hard practice and now they gotta go play a game against, you know, some of the world's best players. You know, so it's really hard to sort of, kind of get into a momentum when a random postponement can, can really throw it off or, you know, completely just throw it all, all out of whack. Um, but with that being said, and, and going on a, a former Hurricanes player, have you heard the rumor about Eric Stahl potentially getting onto the Olympic roster? And do you think Stahl ends up signing someplace else come uh, maybe after the, after the, you know, around the trade deadline? 
uh, after, the, after the Olympics. Honestly, this whole kind of season, since the season began, he's been kind of one of those players that, you know, I'm constantly checking to see that your team picked him up. Like him and Bobby Ryan, both of them are two players that I fully anticipated at this point in the season to be playing. Um, I think he does. He is one of the players who probably does have a chance of playing for, for the Olympic team. Um, but I'm pending him actually signing, you know, with a with a NHL team. I think it might be beneficial for him to just sign with an NHL team as soon as possible. Um, but yeah, I definitely I can't see. It, so I'm not sure if you know his plans are to do the Olympics and then kind of go from there and maybe sign towards towards the playoffs, which I think he'd be a great boost, you know, at a prorated cost for for a team going in. Because I mean, he wasn't bad in Montreal. Um, I'm not sure what Montreal was thinking by not trying to at least get him up for one more year. Um, I think I don't think he's like would have turned their season around. But obviously Montreal is struggling right now. Okay, let's be um, real here. Let's be real here. Jesus couldn't turn around the Canadian season. Okay. <laughs> Jesus, <laughs> Jesus would have said, "I'm going to go out to the desert. I'll be back in like a minute." Okay, I, I swear to God, back in like 20 days. Okay, you're fucking done for the 40 years based on what he's seen in the Canadian. But yeah, Canadian type of right yeah. now. I think, yeah, I think he's going to sign. I think it'd be stupid for a team not to get him if they can. Um, I think he could be, you know, a great third or fourth line center for a team at a low cost and, and who could come up huge in the playoffs. I really don't think he's lost a step since his Carolina days. I just think he's had some pretty, he's been on some pretty poor teams that really fit his style. I mean, you look at Minnesota and then Buffalo and then and then Montreal, you know what I mean? I think with the right fit, he's still can be a great player. Oh, completely agree. And honestly, like, he was very effective at playing wing as well. Uh, he's one of those players that you can really, he's great at being able to do both, right? I know that, that I believe it was with his time with the Canadians in the playoffs, they started throwing him occasionally on the wing because when you, when you play center, it's an easy transition over to the wing, especially when, you, when you've got someone uh, that size. You know, so I, it's it's been really great to be able to see um, to see him to do as well as he did last season, and I just I feel like someone's gonna sign him. You know what I mean? It is, I you can't envision. I, I do think this is probably his last year, regardless. Either way, uh, I don't I don't foresee him. I, I think what I don't know what think is gonna happen. I think he's probably gonna be like a fourth line player for the on the Olympics. You know, he's a he's a great character guy. He's been a leader before. He's a good he's a good player to expose to some of these younger players that they're. Like my understanding is they're, they're trying to send some of the 18, 19 year old guys who haven't who haven't signed the entry level deals with the with their their respective clubs yet. Send them off to the Olympics. I could definitely see them throwing a stall in there, sort of kind of help lead the way for these younger guys. I just you know I don't and I don't necessarily think it's going to be Carolina. Um, though if if they circle back to him. I, it wouldn't surprise me if, if Carolina can't make the, the type of splash they want at the trade deadline. I wouldn't necessarily be surprised to see them sign uh, Stall, but I'm no way advocating for it. But it just I'm just saying it wouldn't necessarily surprise me. So yeah, I I mean I wouldn't. Yeah, that wouldn't surprise me either. I mean I mean he's played with Brenda Moore. I'm sure they still have like a good relationship. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, kind of piggybacking off that though, what kind of I mean, do you think the Carolina Hurricanes are going to be trying to bring in some pieces of the deadline? Or, I mean, they, yes. they've been really good this year. I mean, despite everything they've so, gone through. So the Hurricanes are in a really, really awkward position right now because they've got like six six players at the end of the season whose contract expires, and some of them are way too good to just let walk away. Uh, namely, Vincent Trocheck and uh, Tony D'Angelo being the two big names that stick out to me as players you really don't want to just let walk away for nothing. Um, TDA makes, uh, uh, Tony, uh, Tony D'Angelo makes $2 million a year. Um, with rumors speculating about Klingberg wanting out of Dallas, I could easily see uh, Waddell trying to make a, a, a move there to try to, to, try to get uh, TDA out because we've seen what the Canes can do without Tony D'Angelo, and they can, they can still be good and effective without him. But it's it's I still think the team's better with him. Uh, but at the same point in time, if you're not going to re-sign him uh, next next year, you know you're ah uh, dude that just that's that that worries me a little bit because it, he is the caliber of player where you can get a lot back for him. You could definitely get a, a, a game-changing piece 
or you know, even if it comes out to, to trading with another team that's, that's also in playoff contention as well, say, hey, you know, we've got a, a great puck moving defenseman who we're not going to be able to resign, but we would like to get, you know, uh, you know, maybe someone like, like Gar, uh, Garland from, from Vancouver, not that they're competing, you know, going for a playoff spot, but hey, we would like to pick him off. You know, is there a trade? Is there, is there something there? You know, um, Vincent Trocek being the other one, uh, with Marty Natchez being up as a, as a restricted free agent, he's probably going to get, in my opinion, ballpark between six and seven million, probably for a four or five year deal. You can't either you trade him now because you're not going to be able to re-sign him, uh, Natchez, or you sign Trocheck. You can't. You're not going to be able to. You're not going to be able to afford both. Essentially, I think Nito Niederreiter love him to death. I think he's aware of the fact that he has to. You know, if he's gonna, if he wants to have a contract next year, he's gonna have to start playing his butt off. He's been he's been better than the last like five or six games, but he's still before the five or six games, he would disappear for a game or two. And when you're up for a contract, that's the worst thing you can do is just disappear. I do think the fact that Nita Niederreiter is probably going to end up on a different team next season, next season, and that's okay, right? That's okay. He came in on a great deal with I think it was like five point five million. He's been here for three years now. We were able to get rid of the Victor Rask contract, and Rask just got uh, waived by uh, Minnesota. So it's <laughs> for now. That, <laughs> <laughs> he always finds his way back to an NHL roster. I don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> he might start cutting tendons again. Who knows? Like, <laughs> but um. But no, I think the fact that the Hurricanes are in a good position right now, honestly. Um, we started out, we saw what the team looked like these last two games without Jacob Slavin. Uh, the Blue Jackets game was a little little earth shattering for some people, but it's it's hockey, you know. Like I said, with having so many days off and then having to play a team that was hungry, you're gonna you're gonna have your games that where you lose six nothing. That's that's one of those games that Robert Norris just threw on the tape. It's not even worth watching, you know. I'm pretty sure happy to do that game. He's just like, all right, we'll just get through it. It's going to suck. But, you know, there's no use in yelling, screaming, and getting mad over something that, you know, it, it's it's sort of kind of just fell apart in his lap. It's nice that we're mid-season with games in hand and we can do that. But if this was at the end of the season, it'd be a completely different story where it's not the level of acceptable, which is something really interesting that's going to happen with the whole COVID situation is what happens when we get into the last two or three weeks or, or when we're still having games postponed. You know, that's um, true. Yeah. But uh, Frederick Anderson has been playing lights out in the articles that I wrote about him on the spawn, the Flipping Pucks and Chuck and Nuts website. Lights out. Guy has been at everything that, that we were, we would have hoped for. Um, I think that playing in front of the defense that he's been playing in front of consistently, you know, we just, we just make each other look good. You know, when there is a glaring mistake from uh, the, the defense, Frederick Anderson can, um, can 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 save him and, and vice versa. But Frederick Anderson gets himself out of position. You have your Aho is your your Slavens your the occasional touch the call play where he just sw- he sw- wipes it out and and just doing great things. I'm super excited for this team going into the playoffs. I do think this team right now has champ- is championship caliber. If, if like I said, I think that the Canes will end up making a move to pick up uh, maybe a little bit more veteran piece, which is why if there is a reason for Eric Stahl to fit in, it would be, it'd be for that reason, just veteran leadership. But um, I completely see this team being able to go the distance. It will be interesting to see whoever, I think whoever gets out of the Metro wins the cup, honestly. Um, I think we're going to have a very interesting playoff down in, in, in the Atlantic division where I think Tampa, Florida is probably going to be, um, Tampa and Florida are going to essentially I think Tampa's going to end up losing to Florida at some point, either 2-3 or, or, or more than likely uh, in their quarterfinal. Um, I think it's just it's exciting to see uh, how that division is going to go. But the Rangers are, are just beasts right now. Uh, Adam Fox has, has come as advertised. Um, but, yeah, it's, 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 it's been great. And your, your Washington's been, been on fire as well. So... Yeah, I mean, kind of going back to the Rangers, I, the, as far as, like, the Caps go, I haven't seen uh, – Caps saw the Rangers opening night, and that was it, right? And they, they kind of mm-hmm. show at them. So, like, every mm-hmm. you know, every day I'm checking the standings, see how things go. And I'm, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll admit I'm a little shocked where the Rangers are at right now. Not that I didn't think they had a good roster, 
But, you know, I mean, they've kind of, I mean, Carolina was pretty much pacing the Metro the whole way you know, since the beginning of the season, right? And they're kind of still up there, and the, the Caps were kind of um, kind of right up there too. But the Rangers just, just jumped, and, and they they just keep winning games. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty pretty impressed with them too. And I kind of do, I do agree. I do think the team that comes out of the Metro um, definitely has has a good good odds of, of winning the Stanley Cup. Um, Florida kind of they I mean I know they're good and and they had that great battle with Tampa last year in the playoffs or whatever um, but I'm going to be honest I also did not expect them to kind of re- I almost expected them to kind of do what Montreal is doing now and maybe you know let down some people um, but I yeah. mean they continue to continue to be up there as well so I mean I, especially with the the whole coaching issue and, and and all that you know a couple months ago like how, how is that going to affect a team and it really doesn't seem to have hurt their on ice performance you know, if anything, they've only, you know, they've persevered and just continued to roll off wins. Yeah, that's that's the crazy thing, right? So with, with everything that happened with, with Quinville, you would have swore that this team would have just tanked. Um, you know, sort of kind of like, like how their attendance normally does. Um, but, you know, it's it's one of the situations where it's, I'm surprised that, that Florida is doing as well as they are. But they've been rebuilding for like 15 years. So at some point, is you're going to have to like fall into success at some point, you know, <laughs> eventually you're going to have to, eventually you're going to draft the right players, right? At some point, you know, unless you're Buffalo. So. <laughs> you got to help that team. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, did you see the, um, they had a clip on, on Twitter that was a referee telling uh, 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 Jeff Skinner to go F himself. No, so, like, thought, oh, wait, yeah. oh, like actually in the game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, in game, in game. It was, it was hilarious. Uh, oh, man, that, that, that poor guy, dude. I can't imagine being Jeff Skinner, you know, going through. He, he went from, you know, all these years of, of not making the playoffs here to, like, almost making the playoffs his first season in Buffalo and then just go right back to tanking it. Now, he, you know, he's, he's in the process of another rebuild. Oh, man, and he's making, he's making so much money the team can't trade him. You know, like uh, yeah, dude. he's kind of fucked. I, yeah, I would be like, if, if if I was like looking at the standings and and then watching the highlights and see what Carolina is doing right now, I'd be pissed. But you know what I mean? Because uh, he, I mean, at the time, he was going to be that core. He was going to be what Aho is and uh, Sveshnikov yeah. is. And, yeah. So that was the thing, right? So like right before the day of the draft, when we when we got Sveshnikov, right? We hadn't traded Jeff Skinner yet, and I remember thinking to myself, I was like. Aho and Svechnikov and Skinner on the same line. There is so much talent there, you know. And then when they traded him, I, I remember when they first traded him, I was infuriated. But like the more I sort of kind of thought about it and saw it and how the season sort of played out, I was like, all right, that was, that was a decent play. Honestly, you know what would be the best thing for Jeff Skinner to do? The Evander Kane thing is literally just make it so they, they terminate no. his contract. <laughs> <laughs> make it so they terminate his contract. And, and just and just every and go their separate ways. Maybe go through, do something so where to the point where like, you know, maybe play have to play a little bit at the, at the AHL level or something, and then jump back in and, and then try to jump back in for a reasonable three million dollar deal and then get on a better team. You know, like it, it it's almost worth it for Jeff Skinner to, to sabotage part of his career so he can play on a better team. So. Yeah, I mean, I, there's nothing wrong with. It's sometimes you just need that reset button, right? I yeah. mean, look at oh, definitely. look at D'Angelo in Carolina. I mean, I mean, and you, I feel like we both kind of addressed it in a positive way when we found out that you know Carolina signed him. All the off ice shit. I mean, you know he's a good player. It's just a matter of if he's mm-hmm. in the right system and stuff like that. And I feel like Jeff Skinner's granny doesn't have the same off ice issues that you know D'Angelo did. Mm-hmm. But if, I do. I think that just goes to show that sometimes like that reset and just finding the right team can really reinvigorate your career. Oh, definitely, completely. I think the fact that um, the, the big issue that Tony D'Angelo was kind of was was he he's an asshole, right? And we live in a world now where like you can't really be an asshole on social media, you know? Like people will destroy you, especially if you're some type of like public figure, like a hockey player. You know, yeah. you can't really say those things. You can think them all day. And if, and if it was, you know, some random guy down the street saying those things, you wouldn't think twice. You say, oh, that's, that guy's just a douchebag, right? But it's a hockey player. And so you're going to have a, especially coming from a very liberal state of New York, you know, you're not going to have that ability to just be like, oh, you know, it's, it's whatever, it's fine, you know? Yeah. Um, 
So coming down to a smaller market like a uh, uh, like Carolina was certainly probably the best thing for him because he still doesn't he, <laughs> he doesn't have a, he doesn't have a Twitter account anymore. <laughs> so can't I mean can't really play yeah, that guy. No, um, yeah, right. So, um, but yeah, I think that. Um, so, so speaking of, of, of problematic players, what do you think about the whole Evander Kane thing, and then him? And the rumor was that he was supposed to be going to Edmonton, and then that was retracted, and now we're not quite sure where he's going to end up. Yeah, so that's kind of where I I would kind of left it was I saw on then I'd been having a sabbatical from social media myself, but I just re, you know resigned on Instagram and whatnot, and and I saw like that the day I signed on that he was allegedly had a contract with Edmonton or whatever. And this was like Kevin Weeks or someone reporting it. Um, uh, so you cut your, honestly, I don't think he should be an NHL player. I don't care how good he is. I think, I mean, I think he could add, you know, stuff to a team. Um, I just think like there's, I'm, I really equate him and this is kind of on the nose too, to like, like Antonio Brown in the NFL. Right, like great player, great player, but it's not like he's had one issue and it's been one year or two years. Like we've been talking about Vander Kane's off ice shit for you know like five years now, if not longer. Right, like, yeah. and it's it has nothing to do with whether or not he's going to put up points or score goals. Right, it's just he's he's not going to change. Um, I mean, you, you, it doesn't matter what team he's on. It doesn't matter how good the leadership is. He's going to be who he is. I think at this point. Um, yeah. From Edmonton's standpoint, I could maybe see them taking a, a, a page on him simply because they're at the point where they need to push themselves over the hump. I mean, they have three really, really, really good players. Um, and, and I do think for them it's going to be Stanley Cup or bust here in the next couple of years because, I mean, yeah. this is me, just me tossing it out there, but at what point does McDavid – oh fuck i'm not winning i need to move on type of thing right like i don't think he cares so much about individual and and regular season success as much now it's like he needs a stanley cup um yeah so i think it i I think you honestly and and i know you really don't want the the players running the running the show but i think i I think you would have to sit down with dave and be like hey are you okay if we bring this guy in he probably Mm -hmm. knows the office issues but i do think you need to get that past you know, the captain of the team to make sure that, Hey, can you, can you accept that uh, for the potential yeah. of him maybe turning the team around and pushing you over the edge? I personally wouldn't do it, but I, I could see Edmonton do it. But at the, outside of that, I really, I wouldn't think a team would want to deal with it. Yeah. It, it's just crazy. Cause like, it's almost like, 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 you know, how, you know, all the cartoons where the little snowball starts at the top of the mountain and it just rolls bigger and bigger and bigger. And by the end, it's just like an avalanche, right? It's like, it was like a rumor that he had gambled away all his money. Then it was he beat his wife. Then it was he faked a COVID passport. Then he didn't show up to the AHL team. Then it's just like, oh, dude, just do something right. You know, you know what I mean? I wouldn't necessarily say I don't think that he should not play in the AHL. I just think that, you know, you look at him like he's like he's going to be a locker room cancer. There might not be a single person. I don't even know if Rod Burdenmore can bring that guy around. Oh, you know I what agree. I mean? Yeah. Like, it's a situation where it's like, oof, dude, I don't know. M- mind you, six foot three, he's lean, he's he's a power forward, he's going to put up points. I think the only teams that are going after him are truly desperate. That being said, yes, I, I do think the Oilers will probably end up signing him. But you want to talk about, like, a cancer going into a cancerous situation. You know what I mean? You, that locker room is a time bomb right now. It will not surprise me if, if Oilers struggle again this show the rest of the season and they start off struggling next season. If Drysider or McDavid, if one of them doesn't say, I want to trade him out, I need to get out of here. Because there's no way you can tell me that both of those players are, you know, they're struggling so hard right now. And it's, it's you can't, essentially at the end of the day, I think McDavid and Drysider sign on for too much money. And they have no idea how to build a team around those two players. Like, no idea. Like, I, like perfect example. Here's a perfect example for you. Ethan Bear for Warren Fogle. <laughs> that was a trade that happened over the summer. Hurricanes fans are aware of it. Ethan Bear is a great hockey player. Decent defenseman. 
If he plays, you know, he plays with Slavin as a one-two combo. I think he's more or less a little bit more of a three-four guy on his actual skill by himself. But you trade a three-four guy for a bottom six player, and you're hoping that that bottom six player can do something more. Come on, like that's stupid. Like, like everyone knows, like you know, you're 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 a huge Warren Vogel fan. I'm aware, but like <laughs> you know, top line checking from behind type of guy. I'll tell you that. <laughs> I'll start in that. <laughs> <laughs> but what I'm saying, though, is, like, I didn't like Warren Fogo, and I didn't like Rock McGinn. For those of you who don't know, there's a great rant on uh, on, the, on the YouTube of me going off on Warren Fogel, or, or not Rock McGinn, excuse me. But with Warren Fogel, it seems like he will appear for, like, two games and then disappear for ten. And that's really hard to get consistency you know, you could you could put Warren Vogel with McDavid, and he would somehow find a way to disappear. Houdini would be really fucking impressed, like no joke. Um, but I just, at the end of the day, it's just like you need consistency from these players, and they can't get consistent goaltending. They can't get consistent defense. Their offense revolves around two players essentially. They and they've tried putting other pieces around them. At this point in time, like maybe you look at you, you send a McDavid to. You know, in Arizona for seven first round picks or something just, you know, absolutely just ridiculous, you know. You send them to another team and, and they just get whatever, you know, Edmonton gets whatever they want. Or maybe maybe now I'm get maybe a dry settle where you have you have to do something because the current lineup isn't working, right? And you're, you're, they keep on beating their head. Like the goaltending situation, they're, they're, they're thinking that they're going to make the playoffs on Mike Smith, a 41 year old goaltender. Like, what happens when he pulls a groin or if the game's at 10 o'clock at night and he has to go to bed early? You know, like, like you're at a point where, like, you're, you can't be putting all your eggs in that basket. Because uh, Keegan, I think it's his name, say his name uh, is trash. It's, it's, it's horrible. Like, like you know, I, I've, I've been hearing and, and hearing all these how bad the, their backup goes. And so I just, you know, we just watch a game. Oh, boy. <laughs> Letting things just—he's—he's he's holier than Swiss cheese, dude. Like it's—it's—it's it's, it's saying something. He's—he's he's not a good goaltender. So at some point in time, you gotta say, okay, well, goaltending sucks. Defense needs work. We don't have enough offense. We don't have enough goals getting scored. Like, so what do you got going for you besides the fact that you've got two of the best players in the world who can't win a games by themselves? Honest to God, I'm sure McDavid would love to throw goaltending pads on if that meant actually being able to win a game. And so. I, I mean, I think that's exactly what you said kind of going back to the cane thing is like you're you're aware of you're putting a cancerous player in a cancer situation but they're desperate right they're like seven seven points out as of today of like a playoff spot of like a wild card or whatever like that it, but then yeah. you look you look and mcdavid and dry settle are pacing the league in points and goals like how does that happen and i you know i'd say maybe all right well if it was the this was the only year where They've been experienced in this situation. That's fine. But it's been going on since McDavid's rookie year. Like, it, I mean, mm-hmm. so to your point, like they've had they've had opportunities and chances to build a team around these players and they're just not. And, and to be honest, it's not even like they're making moves that look good on paper. Like the moves they're making are questionable at best. So then it's like it doesn't work yeah. out. And are you really shocked? No. I mean, like you said, Mike Smith is 41. Like, how, how do you even expect him to be that guy especially when your defense is already kind of shady to begin with right like i mean mm-hmm. then you you hope your your goaltender can kind of bail you out of some games but i don't think a 41 year old's a guy to do that um right. so i mean yeah I, 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 with with a cane i i wouldn't be shocked if he does sign with edmonton i think out of all the teams in the league he, they're probably the the front runner there um but again you're doing it knowing who you're getting what you're getting it won't be a shock um, and then you just you yeah. just hope that he's able to you know kind of help them, kind of get them in the playoffs down the stretch and maybe make a difference in the playoffs. But so I'm also curious though if like if I'm Edmonton if I'm not talking to, to the Canadian government and being like, hey, if we sign this player, you guys go let him in because <laughs> like he's fake he's fake the COVID the, the COVID passport right? He's uh, he's he's done some shady things. So I, I don't wonder if you don't maybe say. Uh, you guys gonna let him let him in the country? Are we gonna be able to travel with this guy? Is he aware he's gonna have to get the vaccine? You know, like I, I just think that um, it's sort of sad because 
I, I'm, I'm big into cheering for teams that have struggled for a while. I'm, I'm a Hurricanes fan, right? So, like, obviously I've gone through the, you know, and being a Canes fan since, you know, day one, essentially, I've seen the 10, 11 years of not making the playoffs. So, like, <laughs> I'm just, you know, I can't imagine being an Oilers fan and having the best two players in the world and still not being able to do anything with it when it comes to the playoffs. Because remember, last year they got taken out by, was it was Toronto? No, it was, it was the Jets. Yeah. The Jets took them out. Uh, uh, last season, which which if you could have if you would have pulled a hundred people who would have won that series, everyone I, I I was like yeah this is this is every town day it did ends in a Y and they still still somehow find a, a way to lose, um, yeah, dude it's 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 crazy how how that's all how that's all gone down so yeah I I and I don't know I mean you look at other teams who have had like sure number one picks like Pittsburgh for instance they had Crosby and they had Malkin you know you, you can for the discussion you can equate them to you know McDavid and Dreisaitl mm-hmm. Pittsburgh found a way to surround them with players to get them over the hump Edmonton's had yeah. you know as many years to try and do that and they haven't I mean and and then mm-hmm. even even kind of going to Washington although I don't think Washington really ever had you know a, a game breaker on the level of of um Dry sidle with Ovechkin, obviously they you know they had backstrom and stuff like that, but the Caps still found a way to get into the playoffs and have eventual playoff success with Ovechkin. Right now, McDavid, you're just yeah. wasting his prime, and and the the issues that Edmonton's had have been obvious. I mean, articles have been written about it. Like it's not a surprise, but they just don't seem to 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 find a way. And and there's no no excuses in my mind. You know what I mean? Like at this point. Even with the salary cap and stuff like this, at this point, like you, you need to find yeah. a way. And I mean, who wouldn't want to play with McDavid, right? So it's not. Like, I mean, granted, you're in you're in Edmonton, but talk about a perfect career move, like going. Exactly. To play, granted, you're going to be in cold weather, right? Whatever. Right? Like I know, I know it has that stigma, yeah. right? Edmonton being cold and stuff like that. But who wouldn't want to play with the best player in the world? <laughs> and for some reason, they just can't get the right pieces. Yeah, and that's why I thought it was so weird. Like, like when I read the fact that Warren Fogel had been traded, I figured the trade was coming. I, 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 you sort of kind of you get a sense with, with certain players as a, it's almost like uh, an overall an idea, like when their time's coming to end playing in Carolina, right? You're gonna have your occasional blind side, your, your you know your your Doc which getting traded, something like that. But I feel like most people were under understood the fact that. Warren Fogel was probably gone. We probably weren't going to require him. Pun intended. If we did, it was going to be for the absolute Fair. better no, Okay, no, I'm done. So, like, <laughs> he gets traded, and I'm like, okay. Huh. <laughs> anyway, so, like, goes to, you know, you figure he's going to get traded somewhere. I didn't think in a million years it would be to, to win it. Not to win it, to win it. Damn it. Like, because... He's just not that caliber of player you'd want to bring in, you know. You'd you'd want someone who's if, if you're going to bring in a, a checker, if you will, you'd want someone who's a little bit more physical than what Warren Fogel is. If you wanted a scorer, you'd, you'd want someone who's a little bit more uh, deadly in the offensive zone. It's not someone who's going to fumble the puck or miss pass, you know. I feel like he just wasn't that quite that level of uh, of dangerous, you know, that you really want uh, going back the other way. Not for a, a a bear, a caliber player that, that we were going to get that they sent back the other way. Um, that to me is, is what was sort of kind of surprising. Not to mention going back to some of these other players who aren't who aren't playing right now. Your Eric Stahl, your Bobby Ryan, especially Bobby Ryan, because I feel like Bobby Ryan might actually be able to complement uh, uh, playing on the line with McDavid pretty well, just based on his shot, and his release. You know, if, if McDavid's going to fly into the zone, he's going to get in there quick. You can have he can pull the brakes and look for Bobby Ryan who still has that lethal shot, you know, and still be able to to zig him across, you know. He's he, Bobby Ryan will end up yeah they try to open guy you, <laughs> you, yeah. you know. So they they they, they try to. It's very important. So it's a situation where like, I feel like if you're really going to go through and, and 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 look at players you can pick up who would immediately be impactful to the team. Uh, that would that would definitely be a move. The other thing is I think we all forget about because he's still there is Ryan Nugent Hopkins. 
he still plays in Edmonton. You know, he's just, I think he's like a third, second or third line center. And it's just a situation where maybe it's time to maybe move him and try to get, you know, you know, maybe either a draft pick or, or something a little bit more consistent out of, out of him, you know? Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's Edmonton's a mess. What do you think, what do you end up thinking about? Uh, <laughs> do you think this is the year? Yeah. Maybe you know what? I think, yeah. Um, but I don't think they're going to go all the way. Um, I think winning a series is a good start, but the, I, I still think it'll be another missed opportunity this year. Um, I, I do think Edmonton should at least be looking towards the Maple Leafs is where they like to be because I think they're very similar as, as they're top loaded. Um, but Toronto's actually doing well mm-hmm. and they're making the postseason and they're giving themselves that chance. Yeah. They just haven't had a lot of postseason success. Um, I think it'll, I mean, I don't know, man. Like, I feel like at the end of the day, if you do make the playoffs, a lot of times it's kind of a roll of the dice. Um, you know, how far you go. I mean, bounces and, and stuff like that and things have to go right to you know win a stanley cup um so i think just making the playoffs you know as toronto you you know that's that's a good sign um but i do think i i think if they don't win a series this year we might finally see some changes with some of their key pieces um but i, I mean i can't really say i'm shocked or or surprised about where they're at right now i mean they're in the playoffs yeah. you know as of today um they should be um i know marner has been out for a little bit recently and he just came back so um, I mean, and their and their top players are performing. Um, I when Nylander held out a couple years ago, I w- I wasn't like the biggest fan of that move, just personally. But I mean, he's kind of backed it up. He's his INS performance has been on par. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I I don't think they'll win the cup. I do think maybe they'll win a playoff series. I think either way, if they don't at least make it to the East the, the East Finals or, or the Stanley Cup, then there might be some changes with you know, some of the top guys, but, um, again, but I can't really say it's on the top guys either. Right. But it's just one of those things where changes have to be made and it's easier to get a lot back when you move a big piece. Um, I agree. I, I think there's a, I don't know. I'll say this at the very least, Jack Campbell, uh, is, has gone in there and is actually playing decent goaltending. Of course, when the season started, <laughs> Campbell wasn't their guy. Loving that. You know, uh, Marais was supposed to be their guy. Uh, <laughs> but funny enough, was it two two days in, he gets two games in, he gets injured. Uh, he's missed, you know, almost half the season, if not more. Um, I think uh, I think they might be able to pull it off with Campbell. But Campbell seems like he's a little bit more uh, level headed with things. But I do think the fact that um, I think that they, yeah. the other thing is it's they're not going to be playing Boston. More than likely, they won't. Uh, Toronto won't be playing Boston this this if they were to make just the first the first round of the playoffs, right? It's more than likely going to be the Panthers. Which honestly, if I if I was Toronto, I'd more I'd much rather play, play Boston right now than play the Panthers because the Panthers I feel like are very they're they're flying on, they're flying high right now. That team is 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 fast paced and they're high skill, so it's essentially going to it come down to battle of wit, you know, battle of, battle of pure finesse, and not so much the grinding out that we've sort of kind of seen from from other series between Boston and Toronto. Um, Tuukka Rask is actually trying to make a comeback with Boston. I think he ended up signing a, uh, a contract. Yeah, I saw. I saw it. He, he, yeah, he, he did just with, sign, which I Providence. I mean, I guess I guess that's good. I feel like so, Boston has been playing well well recently. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm not surprised he signed. I'm not sure if he's gonna have the starting job. I feel like the Swayman and stuff have done okay in his absence, right? Um, he's also another goalie who's who's kind of up there in age, but he's proven that he can get it done in the playoffs, you know. So I think I think for Boston, especially at the, I think he signed for a pretty close to minimum, like a million dollars or something. So you're you're really not losing anything by getting it, you know, by giving him a shot. Um, and he, he can be a difference maker in the playoffs. So I think it was a good move by Boston, um, which, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I hate Boston. They've eliminated the Caps in the playoffs yeah, I agree. recently, and I'm not a big fan. And and Brad Marchand, man, fuck. <laughs> hard to hate the guy because he's a good player, but fuck. <laughs> uh, speaking of, of, of good players, how did the Avalanche finally catch him on fire? And Cal McCarr just, just completely uh, 
Just, look like a video game move. Uh, like, I swear. Black Ops in overtime. Yeah. Oh, God, I know. I mean, though, so that, I, I swear that, 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 like, that guy glitched out and just, like, fell yeah, forward. Like, like, my second, second pick, just in general. But, um, yeah, I think Colorado is finally getting all their pieces together. I think, like, Kadri's having an all-star year. I know he wasn't named to the all-star team or whatever, but, like, he's had a really, really, really strong year. Um, obviously, McKinnon was dealing with COVID in the beginning, and then I think he was hurt, and Landis gog has been out for a little bit. So I think their team is finally getting healthy. They're finally able to kind of – everyone getting on the same page at the same time. Um, I had them, you know, as maybe a Stanley Cup winner, if not finalist, um, at the beginning of the season. So it's it, I'm not surprised they're putting it together. Um, I am a little bit surprised it's taken them this long. Um, but I mean, Makar is a stud. Um, I mean, I'm pretty sure like his first NHL goal technically was in the playoffs, right? Like yep. that's just him. I mean, yeah, yeah. Like, and he's just he just keeps getting better year after year. He's yeah, a game, it was. He's yeah. Like, I think he's what Eric Carlson was in Ottawa when when Carlson was kind of catching fire. Um, but I think he's better defensively, and I think he'll be a better player overall. But he at, he has that type of game breaking mm-hmm. ability. And I mean, you saw you saw it in that overtime game. Yeah, that, it was sick. It was, it was it was crazy. I think I think Kyle McCarr is going to end up being the next Paul Coffey, the next Ray Bork. I think he has that that level of skill behind him um, that that he he can completely you know pick up a team and get get on the Avalanche for finding him. You know, and being able to draft that that type of elite type of skill, because now you, essentially it's a it's a similar model to what the, the Penguins sort of kind of had, where like you've got McKinnon being Crosby essentially, and McCarr being essentially uh, your Latang. You know, where he's he's going to be able to to go through and do, you know, and, and run the defense. Do you you've got a, a number one elite number one player? You know, so I think that. Um, it's exciting to see where we're going to end up, where, where Colorado could end up. And I think that, honestly, it's going to be between um, the Avalanche and the, the Knights on who's going to end up taking. Uh, yeah, I, I, I completely agree. And, and it'll be interesting to see what happens when Eichel, you know, eventually suits up for, for Vegas. Because um, that, that could be an X factor there, too. But, I mean, I do think both teams are going to be the ones who are coming out of the West. Oh yeah, I'm I'm really hoping that we get a Western Conference. I don't think we can, can we get no. We can't get a Western Conference final. That's Vegas, Colorado, can we? But like, I definitely want oh, that to be sure. like, you know, that that should be the Western Conference final. Let's be honest here. So, but so, good question then. So, do you prefer the one through eight um, seeds, or do you think or do I you like don't the separate like divisions? How they're doing it now. Um, that said. I like it because it does give these teams chances who might not have been maybe playoff teams beforehand. Like like Detroit, for instance, for a little while there, they were kind of in the wild card, right? And I think if, if it weren't like the, if the playoff format weren't like it was now, you know, they might not be, they wouldn't have been in that talk initially, right? Um, yeah, I mean, I, man, I don't know. Because like, who, what's going to happen with, the COVID shit and stuff when the playoffs eventually come around, that could totally affect how they end up again. I mean, look at the one year where they're doing the bubble and stuff like that. That could potentially happen again. I don't know, especially with like, like the Canadian teams and stuff. Um, you know, do they try and try and do it where they're playing all the games in the United States just because mm-hmm. it's easier than, you know, having to cross borders. Um, so I understand, I understand why they're doing it. I like the, you know, I like the format from a couple years ago, but, um, yeah. honestly, it really doesn't make a difference to me. I just anticipate a Capitals playoff loss regardless. <laughs> well, at least McGinn will be scoring those goals as, in a Pittsburgh uniform, not a, not a Canes one. So. <laughs> <laughs> so like, I think I prefer the one through eight seed as opposed to the, the, you know, the, the Metro and the Atlantic and Central and Pacific. I think at the end of the day, I don't want to see the top two teams play each other. I think it's not top two, but the ideally people think that like the number one seed in each division is going to be significantly ahead or be about close to the other ones, and we've seen that's not always the case, you know. So I think I would much rather prefer to see something along the lines of 
games one through eight. So hopefully at the end you, you get one one and two playing each other. You know, um, I I think that would eventually is going to be better for the league. It's been cool having this this last couple of years having these different divisions the way they are because you, you know you now have a very strong Caps Pens rivalry. You now have a you know with last season you have a Tampa Florida rivalry going, and you got Toronto Boston. You know, but at the end of the day, I think hockey fans in general would prefer to see still one through eight because we want to see the best in the East, the best in the West. You know, like I think back to the Golden Knights Santa uh, Shark series. Where that one call sort of kind of took out the other team, you know, with with the five minute uh, uh, was it cross checking from behind? Uh, it, yeah, it should, shouldn't have really happened to start with, and then you feel like you really weren't seeing the best two teams play in, in the in the final, you know. Um, so I think it's still I think it's better this way to have uh, one through eight, and that's just my my personal opinion on on the matter. But uh, going, I do want to go back and hit the, the Eichel situation in Vegas. I think that, like, sort of like what you were saying, that's going to be a complete game changer there. Um, I think that's going to solidify. Um, it's going to really going to solidify that that whole lineup. Uh, he, I think he's going to be solid, probably first line center, if not second line center, and he'll be able to. Um, I, I I think that's going to put Vegas over the top. And it's sort of kind of funny and sad at the same point in time because you see, you hear, you know, I'm on the Kraken fan page all the time, and all I see is, well, why are we so? Why, why do we suck so much? Vegas didn't suck. It's like, slow down, <laughs> slow down. <laughs> that should don't, that doesn't normally happen like that, you know? Yeah. Um, and and now with the Eichel thing, that that's gonna it's just gonna add more fuel to that fire that you know Seattle thinks that they should be good faster, then it's not how it works, you know? So. Um, but yeah, I think Vegas, Vegas, given their whole situation with, with, with you know, you've got uh, Petrangelo back on D, you've got Leonard, you've got Eichel, you've got Stone, you've got great players that pretty much all, each position now that can, can really, you know, each one of them can, can take a team over, make the teams over the top, you know. If Robin Leonard's on his game, he's, he's amazing. If he's calling people drug addicts, you know, completely different story, you know, but... <laughs> It feels like it's it's uh, it's interesting to sort of kind of see just how everything's meshed together over the last four or five years now. Yeah, yeah. Um, I I don't know why Kraken fans are shocked that they're not pulling what Vegas did their first year. Um, different situation, much different looking rosters. Um, and I will say I thought maybe that first year Vegas would be a flash in the pan. You know, but um, they've just made good moves since then. They've continued to make good moves, and they continue to solidify themselves as one of the teams to beat in the West. Um, like you mentioned, Peter Angelo, and and even letting you know Flurry go and putting all their eggs on on Leonard, and even despite you know him kind of being vocal about the league and and how they handle you know drug addiction and, and stuff like that, like he's backed it up on the ice. He you know may, yeah maybe he shouldn't have said what he said you know during the season doesn't seem to have hurt his game any he's kind of backed up what he said and he's played really really well yeah. um there stone's a really really good leader he he continues to, to to put the team on on his back and and same with like max Pacioretty and stuff like that like their top guys are playing like their top guys um and and they continue to be one of the teams to be in the west if not the team to be in the west so um yeah i'm i am I, I never thought the Kraken were going to pull that. Um, so I'm not shocked as to why the, the Kraken fan or fans are a little bit disappointed, but um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. Um, I think Eichel puts him over the hump. I think it'll take him a second to obviously get adjusted to game speed. Um, but I think come playoffs, we might see him kind of, kind of, kind of the whole Kucherov situation where he steps in the playoffs and makes an immediate impact. Um, hopefully he, I, I'm assuming he'll get, you know, a fair share of games before then. But I think once he catches himself up to speed, he's just going to be that X factor. Yeah, I think they were saying Eichel, the target time for me back, like with the team is like end of February, which gives him like two full months essentially of playing with the team before the playoffs even start. So, but you don't also wonder if um, when you bring in a player of that caliber, you expect everything to go well, but wouldn't it be interesting if, if things didn't, you know? Uh, that would, you know, obviously, I don't think that's actually going to happen, but it's always an interesting situation whenever you add a, a superstar like that to a new team, how he's going to be viewed by that team and everything. Um, also, I wanted to hit 
you brought up Flurry. I want to talk about something I never saw coming. I did not see Chicago struggling as much as they have this season. It's it's sort of it's sort of sad almost because you have a you, it sort of feels like this is going to be Flurry's last season, and you I really don't want him to go out uh, losing the way he you know with a losing team like that. Um, I, and just some of these other players that Chicago added, there's Seth Jones. Uh, uh, you know, Kane came back was and was healthy pretty much all season so far. You really thought that like the Chicago lineup would actually have would, was going to look solid and a central division that you know started kind of become uh, the Predators to lose. You know, it seems like the Predators have really come out and uh, are on top of their game right now. Yeah, yeah. Um, I I know as of late here, um, and this might just be like social media rumblings or whatever, but people are talking. You know, do does Chicago try and move Flurry to a contender? Um, I think he should. I think Flurry deserves that. Cause to your point, if this is his last season, and I know before he even, you know, before the season even started, he he it was wasn't sure he was going to even play this season, right? So I do think he deserves better. I do think he deserves another another shot, and I do think it'd be sad if. If you know he, this was his final season, and this is kind of how it went down. Um, I think it hasn't helped that Taves was um, struggling to find find the back of the net for you know like 15 games or whatever. That definitely definitely hurt. But I mean, yeah, going in this start of the season, if you would have said with that roster and where they're at, I wouldn't have believed it. Um, they made some some good moves on paper, and it just hasn't really worked out. Obviously, they had the coaching change mid season, but I never thought Jeremy Colleton was a bad coach. Um, yeah. little young, but I didn't think I. I thought he was at least in the last couple of years he was kind of turning the team around a little bit and and doing yeah. well with what he had, and I thought he was he only had a better team this year, but yeah, yeah that's sort of kind of my thing is like you can't really judge them on last season because they didn't have Kane or Taves last season, right? Um, so like, what exactly are you judging that the coach by? His ability to coach a bunch of AHLers, you know. So this year you actually add him some pieces, and sometimes when you add a bunch of pieces at the same time, it's not going to immediately just mesh instantly. So it takes the team a little bit more to to get into a rhythm. But when you bring in a completely new coach, you don't know what you're going to get. You know, what if the coach just sucks? <laughs> you know, which is I think is where it, was, it might be the issue that Chicago has now. It's a coach that they brought in. Like, this might not. It's taken a while for the players to learn the system and be able to crank out wins. But I feel like the coach that they had was 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 you know people that you also need to remember is like Kane's at, at the end of his at the end of his you know he probably may have maybe three or four more seasons that Kane does right you've got a lot of these players who are now you know the old guard they're they're if you're gonna rebuild you gotta start rebuilding you know you have to start laying down brick in the sense at the end of the day because you've got Kane who's older you've got all these players that are older you know you bring in Mark Andre Fleury who's a great goaltender. But if he doesn't have any defense in front of him, what exactly are you expecting him to do? Yeah. You know? Um, and then the other half of it is, you know, what pieces up front are you really trying to – what pieces have you brought in up front that isn't a rookie who, you know, might – you know, they've got a couple of, a couple of decent skaters up front besides to, to surround them to push around the gainer with. But you expect a little bit more um, because it is Kane. You know, it, it, I think he's going to go down at probably the most, you know – uh, prolific American uh, goal scorer ever, you know. Um, I don't think there's anyone better who come from the states. Like Mike, Mike McDonald is great and everything, but Kaner I think still takes the cake as far as best American board player. Um, but it's it is sad to sort of kind of see that like this is probably the last couple of years that you're going to have Chicago be the relevant team before they're going to have to go into full rebuild. Uh, because I think I did like the the cast that Chicago had. Yeah, they're a very likable team, and it's it's hard not to, like, like you said. I mean, Patrick Kane's electric. He's not only the best American player; he does it with flash, and it, it's yeah. it's easy to like. And then Jonathan Taves is your prototypical leader, right? So, um, it kind of. I mean, granted, it doesn't feel like that. It's been you know like seven years since they were a dominant team. It's it's just kind of sad to see them kind of go the way they are right now. Um, yeah. And they haven't really been in a bad situation to where they're getting the top picks to rebuild. So it's like mm-hmm. almost sort of like Detroit in that instance, too. It's like, all right, they're not going to make the playoffs, but they're not going to be dead last. So they're not going to get that yeah. that number one, number two pick who could instantly jump in and change the, the culture of a team. They're kind of like stuck with these, you know, fifth, sixth overall picks. Who, I mean, maybe they do turn out, but they're not going to instantly jump in. So that yeah. makes the rebuild even harder. 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. And it's Carolina also had the same issue for, I think it was like four or five years where we were like, we'd miss the playoffs by like four points. So like when, you, when you're that close to it, you're, you're, you're picking like 10th or 11th overall. It's like you're going to get someone who should make the NHL probably in like two years, hopefully, if it works out. If they, if they still want to play hockey in two years, you know. Um, but yeah, it's 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 sort of kind of it sucks, you know, because like it's not. Um, and I think the lottery system was sort of kind of made to like help out those teams who were sort of kind of in that weird position. But honestly, I don't, I, I don't like the lottery system at all at the end of the day. Honestly, I think it was it it, it came in with good intentions, but I just don't like it. You know, it, my the Hurricanes definitely benefited from it a little while ago, and I. <laughs> I as a Hurricanes fan, even I think that was a little bit rigged. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you're telling me a new owner comes in and he probably slips somebody a hundred dollar bill, like, yo, can you, uh, you know, do the thing <laughs> so, so they can get Sveshnikov, you know. Um, but yeah, at the end of the day, I think that um, it's been an interesting season. Uh, and I think that I, I'm looking forward to after the trade deadline hits. I'm hoping with the, the weather warming back up some that we don't have to worry about COVID nearly as much. Um, but it would be nice to sort of get, you know, be able to finish off the season strong and not have to post, you know, constantly postponing all these games and whatnot. Just become, you know, obnoxious. So. Yeah, that's that, uh, going forward. That's kind of my hope, too, is that, you know, um, and, and obviously the, the teams that the, the league has kind of re, redone the COVID protocol thing a little bit. So players won't be out, out for as long. Um, but yeah, I hope that kind of mellows out a little bit and we get to actually see the, uh, all these teams healthy um, playing together and, and less games postponed as, you know, gets towards the playoffs because I think that's re- where the real fun begins. Right. And that's re- where you really get to see what some of these teams are made of. Um, I also think like with the COVID shit and stuff that could also affect certain trade deadline moves, you know, teams might be desperate to make a move that they might not have otherwise. Um, so I, I do think it's been, it's been interesting just like the last couple, couple seasons. Um, I think it's been better than the last couple seasons, obviously, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I just wanted a full season of 82, you know, with none of this drama around it, but, um, but yeah, I mean, I really can't complain of where it's, where it's been so far, you know, going into the all-star break and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, no. Um, do you think there's a certain team, you know, with all-star game, you know, right around the corner, do you think there's a team that has an advantage? Would you say the Metro is going to win, or do you think it's going to be a different division? Who wins the all-star game? Yeah. Ooh. Um, I mean, I know they still they still have that last vote, right, to get one more player per, per team. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know, man. I, 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 I really... I, Watching the All-Star game over the last couple of years, it's like the players are just out there having fun. I really question how many of them care, you know, who wins. Um, yeah. So I, I really don't – I'm kind of nepo. I really don't care. I just like to see – like I hope – I mean, granted, I think he's net sub should be an All-Star. I'm, I want so much of Sveshnikov in there for the skills competition alone, right? Like, yeah. So I just want to yeah. see that type of stuff, right? Like have fun with it. It wasn't supposed to be an All-Star year anyway. So like I just I just want the players to have fun and use that as a – as an opportunity to maybe, you know, get rid of some of the drama that's been surrounding the league for, for now and, and just have fun with it and then and then come back refreshed down, you know, the last couple months before the playoffs. Um, I think if I had to guess, I'd probably take the Pacific, but who knows? I don't know. Um. That's, fair. that's fair. I don't like the uh, the current format that they have with them either. I don't think it should be, it should be East versus West, you know? I agree, um, yeah. And it, I thought some of, the, some, of the, some of the voting I thought was also sort of kind of weird. Like, you know, Tristan Jari, the, the, the goaltender from the Penguins, being the Penguins player, getting in. But you don't have Sidney Crosby, you know. And you can't tell me that Sidney Crosby isn't, isn't an all-star still. He isn't, he's not had a great season. And I can honestly, like, for another example, this is going to be popular with the Hurricanes fans. Fred Anderson's a great goalie, but I am not putting, I'm not saying that, you know, he should be going to uh, the All-Star game. You know what I mean? If you're telling me it's, it's between Anderson and Crosby, who should be going to the All-Star game, I'm going to choose Crosby every single day. That's why. You know, no, nothing against Anderson. People know how much I love him, but I was, when, it, when it comes to the All-Star games, I want the absolute best players from every team going to this, going to this little competition. Not necessarily uh, a goaltender because who else are you going to set from that division? You know what I mean? Because, uh, like I said, Tristan Jari should not be the representative from the Penguins. And the fact that like, we're having to vote in Sidney Crosby is sort of kind of, I think it's just silly 
I feel like that's that was their easiest way for them to come go about and just you know like like we'll love to see Svechnikov too, but honestly, let's be honest, Svechnikov and Crosby should both be in, you know. And I'd much rather look at Anderson and be like, eh, no thanks, you know. Yeah. I'd much rather have have the elite players actually playing in and not so much uh, a goaltender of the best team, you know, because <laughs> there is a chance here that you're going to put Anderson out there. Uh, with these all stars, he's going to get lifted up. <laughs> he's going to come back to Carolina. So, his conference is going to be shot. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> They're going to tank. Fucking, no. <laughs> you know, he's going to have to see a therapist for fucking PTSD <laughs> because <laughs> over the all star game, <laughs> there, no defense. No defense. <laughs> It's the three on three competition. You know, like, there's no defense in, in the all star game. It's, it's all about who you score or not. So, um, but yeah, I think I think that that pretty much wraps up uh, this episode, uh, ladies and gents. Uh, one little little note, um, as you guys can obviously tell, it's it's now just Doug and I doing this podcast. Uh, Adam just decided that he wanted to go his separate ways, and we all sort of kind of agreed on it. Um, I think that at the end of the day, we were this was needed to be a, a show that you know was fun. And we could get done in weekly, and sometimes it just wasn't seeming like we could get it done weekly. So um, moving forward, it's Doug and I, we're going to be rocking these out each week. We uh, appreciate the listen. Uh, you can check us on YouTube, uh, Spotify. Uh, we have a blog up on flippinpucksandchuckandnugs.com. Uh, feel free to email us at email us at flippinpucksandchuckandnugs at gmail.com. Uh, let us know what we're doing right. Let us know what we're doing wrong. Let us know how much you love us or hate us or despise us. Uh, And anyway, uh, thanks for listening and have a good night. Have a good night, guys.